What kind of world do I want to live in? I think about this question a lot. For our generation and for specifically my group of people, which is refugees, the circumstances might dismantle any vision of the future that we have. You're trying to rebuild, you're trying to make a future for yourself, and then the climate related disaster come and you start again. It's not about how it's affecting you now, it's about how it's affecting you your entire life. First step to understand is that we're all a part of it. None of us are going to be left out by the crisis. We're at a stage where if we don't act now, really there won't be very much left. There are generations that will never see certain things that we grew up seeing in real life. We have to start treating this like the emergency it is. To achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have to go from an intention to a serious commitment. Business leaders really need to rethink how they conduct their business and invest in creating systems that are climate friendly. I would like to see is accountability. Structures being put in place where countries aren't just asked to do something, but they're kept accountable to the decisions that they make. There has to be that strong collaboration between government, between corporations, between youth activists to drive change forward. The world I would want to live in is a world where imagining the future is not a privilege. I want to live in a world where people do not give up on hope, hope that a positive change is possible. The fact that you're listening today means that you are willing to make a change. Good afternoon and good evening. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session on financing green investment in cities at the World Economic Forum Sustainable Development Impact Summit 2021. I'm Audrey Choi. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer at Morgan Stanley and also the CEO for our Institute for Sustainable Investing. Um, and I'm so pleased that so many people have tuned into this really critical panel around the role of cities. Um, just to put this in context before we welcome our incredible panelists for this discussion today, just to remind how critical cities are to the fate of the planet. Cities consume 75% of the world's primary energy and account for more than 70% of all carbon emissions. And so as we march towards Glasgow and the, the attempts to really try to address climate change, um, we have to think about um, green infrastructure in the urban ecosystem around the world. Um, and so in this session, we are going to plan to do uh, three big things in 30 short minutes to uh, how do we, one, maintain the urgency of investing um, not only in carbon reductions, but really in net zero carbon solutions, and in fact, hopefully nature positive solutions in cities. Um, secondly, how do we align, whether that be at the corporate level, the city level, or the federal level, to really guide investments towards these solutions? And finally, how can we underline the need for collective action? so that we can actually not have great theoretical conversations, but actually real dollars flowing towards real projects to create real change, getting from commitment to action to impact. And so I'd like now to um, introduce and welcome our three, our distinguished panelists joining us today. Um, now this is a on the record plenary conversation, which will be made available online as well after the session. So welcome first of all, um, Mr. Francesco Storace. The CEO and General Manager of NL Italy. Francesco, thank you so much for joining us on this special day. Uh, we also have Commissioner Penny Aviwardina uh, from the great city of New York. Uh, she is Commissioner for International Affairs. Um, and uh, we will also be joined by Minister Carlos Eduardo Correa Escaf, 
who is the Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development of Colombia. Uh, so again, this is an on-the-record conversation. Thank you all so much for joining us. And Mr. Sarace, I'd like to start with you. Uh, Francesco, Enel has been an incredible leader in uh, green finance and really sustainable development generally. Um, actually, just in 2019, Enel issued a very innovative bond that we were so privileged to be able to be the joint book runner on uh, with you on a $1.5 billion bond supporting the SDG 7, affordable and clean energy. And I think what was so innovative about it was it really aligned investors with you to be focused on your clean energy and renewable energy goals. That in fact, if you didn't meet those goals, the financial conditions of the bond actually changed. That was a real innovation that we've seen many corporations coming to us and saying, should we do something like what NL did? It was so innovative. So uh, we were very excited about that. Um, you were also uh, somehow in your spare time are the co-chair of the World Economic Forum Net Zero Carbon Cities Program, bringing together businesses with city and regional and national governments to accelerate this uh, transition. And so I would love it if you could um, elaborate a little bit more for us about the Net Zero Program and how this really helps business leaders like yourselves engage in Net Zero and a more sustainable future. Thank you, Audrey, and, and thanks for uh, for the introduction. Uh, I, I have to add that we kept issuing bonds, and the last one was yesterday. This is a 3.5 billion bond. So it, it, it's this sustainable development gone bond uh, issuing program is continuing, and we are today at about 30% of our debt linked to SDG targets. Uh, oh. We've seen this becoming a, a momentous uh, tool in the in the industry uh, in the bond industry so it's it's many other companies are following as as you said the reason why uh, you, in in my so called spare time i am interested in net zero carbon cities is because it's very well um, uh, showed in your presentation you're saying how many people are living in cities and how much the city's energy consumption is in in uh, in the world, it's it's more than 70%, 75% actually. So the reason why we get in, interested in cities is that as an energy company, as an electricity provider, we see increasingly population in, in cities requiring electricity, consuming electricity. And it is our interest that this electricity is clean and it is produced and distributed and consumed in the most efficient manner. Because the, if that happens, then by doing that, we're tackling 75% of the energy problem of the, of the world. So it's, it's a big uh, auctionable part of the value chain. In net zero carbon cities, we provided uh, an incredible tool. It's a toolbox where all the cities that participate to the program, and by the way, Bogota is, is one of them, uh, their minister. So Colombia is heavily in this, um, provide examples of how a city can be decarbonized, how energy can be used more efficiently, and how the life of citizens can improve if these things are done properly. Experiences of things that worked well, experiences of mistakes made that maybe others can avoid. This toolbox is there. There is a link uh, in the web that uh, can be uh, interrogated if people are interested. And a lot of other cities are getting interested in using this toolbox. Overall, this is a proof that cities become a very important part of the energy use in the world. It's, they are like a country on their own, if you want. There's much, many, much more similarities across cities than there are across geographies and states. So it's a very, very important point where to work in, in this sense. Um, as Enel, we are, of course, in big cities. We have distribution networks in most large metropolitan areas of Latin America and, and many metropolitan areas of Europe. And we know how big the difference it is when you digitize the network, when you put, when you enable citizens to use efficiently their, uh, their energy. And we have uh, today the largest digitized network system around the world comprising cities uh, in, in many large um, countries in uh, South America and in Europe. We believe this trend is going to take place around the world. And we think that the transformation on the energy efficient uh, front and on the sustainable uh, energy supply front 
will be in the cities will be fundamental to meet the Paris goals. To do that, we need to align public and private partnerships in the right way. Also here, there are examples of failures and examples of uh, success. And I think everything starts from uh, trust between the public and the private segment. And that is the clear point of everything, uh, starting with the right foot. Trust is the key word going forward in this uh, energy transition. And we could think cities uh, are important to establish this trust around the world. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Francesco. And I love so many of the things that uh, that you just said there in terms of the trust between public and private and business and citizens. Um, and I, I love that the toolbox, um, as you said, not only has the, um, the successes, which everyone loves to brag about, but also the failures, because I'm a, a big believer that learning what to not yeah. do with someone who's honest about the failures is such a huge contribution. So so thank you for your, for your leadership on that. Um, uh, you know, and I, I wanted to Turn to Penny now, and Penny, as you know, as we think about this, I love one of the lines that Francesco just said about how cities are like a country on their own, and uh, and that is in many ways definitely true of uh, of uh, you know my hometown, and you're a great city of New York City, which is uh, so iconic in so many different ways. Um, you know, and New York is right now really on the forefront of so many things on climate change. Um, you know, obviously a very sort of exposed city, exposed to rising sea, um, just rising sea level, temperature extremes, and uh, obviously, you know, extraordinary density so that any weather impact, you know, affects millions of people. And uh, unfortunately, we've seen tragically just recently with the aftermath of Hurricane Ida, how quickly and unexpectedly that can become, you know, really, really a, a matter of life and death. And New York has also been an incredible leader at the forefront of sustainability policies, investments. And so I'd love to um, get your vision for, you know, what a net zero journey and a green recovery means for New York City. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Audrey. And it is such a pleasure to join all of you today um, with the World Economic Forum. Francesca, you will enjoy that um, much of the last eight years as I've worked with the UN and with member states, um, I like to mention that New York City is as large as not larger than 141 countries. So um, <laughs> we, this, is, this is our foundation for trying to uh, explore partnerships. And so, you know, the de Blasio administration is coming to an end. It's been eight years. Um, and from day one, the administration has been committed to tackling global warming. Superstorm Sandy happened right before we took office. Um, just to remind people participating, it killed 44 New Yorkers displaced thousands of others and left $19 billion in damage in its wake. And so we knew that the next superstorm was not a matter of if or when. So over the years, we've been working to ensure that New York City becomes more resilient and sustainable. And our significant benchmark of green leadership was the launch of our New York City Green New Deal back in April 2019. Now, this is a $14 billion initiative with ambitious targets that will ultimately cut emissions by about 40% by 2030. Some of these targets include requiring all large buildings to conduct retrofits to lower their emissions, which is a global first, banning construction of all glass facade buildings. Now, there are some ex uh, exemptions, but they were made only if they followed strict guidelines, mandating organics recycling and end ending unnecessary city purchase of single-use plastic utensils. And of course, we've been um, really trying to be part of the leadership um, on climate accountability and owning that space. We've uh, been divesting $5 billion in our pension funds from fossil fuel companies and reinvesting that money in renewable energy. We partnered with the city of London and C40 cities to create the first ever Divest Invest Forum to support cities worldwide, divesting their funds from fossil fuels. Now, even after COVID hit our city, I think many of you remember New York City was the epicenter of the pandemic here in the US last spring. We continue to make climate action a priority because we know that global warming is our threat multiplier. In fact, climate and environmental justice are key components of our COVID-19 fair recovery for all. And this year, as we kicked off Climate Week, the mayor has introduced several key initiatives to help cut our city's greenhouse gas emissions. On Sunday, we announced the launch of Electrify New York City, a program that will provide free services for owners of one to four unit family homes, particularly our low and moderate income families in Queens and Staten Island, to reduce energy costs, improve air quality, and fundamentally cut greenhouse um, gas emissions. 
Now, these particular kinds of buildings are well suited for electri electrification using air source heat pumps, thereby eliminating their reliability on fossil fuel gas and oil for heating. Now, these buildings have also, they have high potential for lower energy costs through, slow, through solar panel installations. We know that these emissions generated from heating, cooling, and powering one to four family homes account for about 20% of New York City's greenhouse gas emissions from buildings. So through this new program, New Yorkers will gain equitable access to green technologies through no cost technical assistance for property owners. We're prioritizing working with contractors from our minority and women owned businesses. And I should mention that this program is part of New York City's effort to install about a thousand megawatts of solar in the five boroughs by 2030 and to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Now on Monday, the mayor joined our New York governor, Hochul, to announce two major green infrastructure projects that will power our city with wind, solar, and hydropower. The Clean Path New York and the Chaplin Hudson Power Express projects are going to produce approximately 18 million megawatt hours of upstate and Canadian renewable energy per year, enough to power more than two and a half million homes, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 70, 77 million metric tons over the next 15 years, which is the equivalent of taking 1 million cars off the road and providing 2.9 billion in public health benefits over 15 years that will result from reduced exposure to harmful pollutants. Now, once completed, these infrastructure projects will create approximately 10,000 family sustaining jobs statewide and bring about 8.2 billion in economic development investments, including developer committed investment to support disadvantaged communities. Fundamentally, all of this work is to ensure that we can have a more equitable society throughout our five boroughs. Now, these projects will help reduce the city's reliance on fossil fuels, lower carbon emissions, and significantly improve air quality and public health in our disadvantaged communities. Now, they will also help meet the mayor's commitment to power city government operations with 100% clean and renewable electricity by 2025. And we fundamentally know that local governments we can't do this work alone. And so we are heavily relying on our on public private partnerships to help create the sustainable future we need. And these initiatives I mentioned are all due to such partnerships. So Electrify New York City is run by the Mayor's Office of Climate and Sustainability in partnership with Kinetic Communities and Neighborhood Housing Services of Queens and Staten Island. The Clean Path New York Project was developed by Forward Power and the New York Power Authority. And the Chaplin Hudson Power Express project was developed by Transmission Developers Inc., which is backed by Blackstone and Hydro Quebec. As a society, we know we can't afford to live in silos. And as Francesco said, it is about building trust. And part of doing this work is doing it along with the private sector as well as the community. Thanks, Audrey. Hi. Penny, thank you so much. That was like an incredible whirlwind tour of all of the different things that you're doing. Uh, and what I love. <laughs> Definitely. Well, you know, what I, what I love about it especially is I think you really laid out a great um, roadmap and picture for how if a, um, you know, if, if policymakers are focused on climate change, and if you're doing it holistically, you're not just solving an environmental issue, you're creating jobs you're addressing social equity through climate justice and doing special you know, investments for those who are most vulnerable to it, which are you know, the, the lower income and um, disadvantaged groups. And also, of course, protecting the um, infrastructure resilience and the resilience of life uh, in your city. So I think that's an incredible, uh, you know, again, if done right, an incredible a tour de force of you know, multiple stakeholders really benefiting from, from forward climate action. Um, so thank you, Penny, for all of, all of your and the city's leadership there. Um, uh, we're so excited also to be joined uh, by Minister Carlos Eduardo Correa Scott. Minister, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, I'd love to, to turn to you now. Hi. Um, I'd love to turn to you to ask you to take, you know, we've, uh, Francesco has talked about sort of the corporate level of action, what, how important global corporate leadership is. Commissioner Abney Wadian has talked about the city, and I'd love for you, given your role, to talk really about at a national level, how policymakers um, can really work with cities and the private sector to play that critical role of a national policy leadership in addressing uh, climate change and especially green investments in cities. So, Minister uh, Carlos. Bueno, muchas gracias. <laughs> muchas gracias, Audrey, y a mis compañeros de, de panel. 
Creo que aquí hay un tema muy importante y gracias por esta oportunidad luego de escucharlos hablando del sector corporativo, hablando de, de, de las ciudades, desde las ciudades, desde las grandes ciudades que hoy hemos podido ver. Yo antes de ser ministro de Ambiente y Desarrollo Sostenible de, de mi país, fui alcalde también, fui alcalde de una ciudad intermedia, una ciudad de 500 mil habitantes y, y desde ahí pude ver el poder que tiene eh, la política pública, la política pública nacional. Y hoy las ciudades tienen unos grandes retos, pero esos grandes retos tienen que estar apoyados desde la política pública y por eso desde el gobierno, por ejemplo, en el caso del gobierno de Colombia, estamos haciendo varias acciones encaminadas precisamente a, a esto. De una primera, y que ya lo han mencionado algunos de ustedes, tenemos un gran reto al año 2030, que son nuestras NDCs. En el mes de diciembre del año 2020, nuestro presidente Iván Duque eh, mencionó que Colombia tendría una nueva actualización de su compromiso en el marco del Acuerdo de París, de un 51% de reducción de emisiones al año 2030 que al mismo tiempo llegaremos a cero deforestación en el año 2030 y una proyección al año 2050 de ser un país carbono neutral. ¿A qué voy con esto y por qué inicio contándoles desde el momento en que fui alcalde eh, y desde las ciudades? Porque esto es una política nacional, una política nacional que no puede ser vista solamente desde el Ejecutivo, sino también desde el Legislativo. Entonces, en los próximos días estaremos radicando al Congreso de la República una ley que es la Ley de Acción Climática. Y la Ley de Acción Climática incorpora las 196 acciones que tienen nuestras NDCs en una ley de la República. Así que lo que buscamos es que no solamente sea un tema del Ejecutivo o de un plan de desarrollo de cuatro años, sino que esto trascienda a los próximos gobiernos. Y con base en el establecimiento de una política pública sólida, de una ley de la República, estamos trabajando con el sector privado, donde ya firmamos acuerdos con más de 100 compañías, acuerdos de carbono neutralidad, ya estamos firmando acuerdos con las 30 capitales de los 30, de los 30 departamentos que tiene nuestro país para que cada uno de estos alcaldes se comprometan a hacer ciudades carbono neutrales también al año 2050, pero por supuesto en una ruta muy clara que es la que hemos establecido. Entonces, Audrey, con base en esto, lo que estamos haciendo desde la política pública, desde las leyes, desde el Congreso de la República Legislativo, es dejar un camino trazado donde cada uno de los alcaldes, cada una de las ciudades se va a unir. Se va a unir en una autopista hacia el año 2050, una autopista que busca la carbono neutralidad en los próximos 30 años y esa autopista tiene varios carriles. Un carril que es nuestra lucha contra la deforestación, la siembra de árboles, que estamos ahora sembrando 180 millones de árboles, la restauración, la educación ambiental. Un carril que es la movilidad limpia y sostenible, un carril que es la transición energética, un carril que es la economía circular, la agricultura sostenible y la educación ambiental. Todo esto va encaminado en esa gran autopista a llegar a la carbono neutralidad. Entonces, de los temas más importantes es poder involucrar a nuestros alcaldes, a nuestro sector privado, en un único propósito que es ser carbono neutrales y ser sostenibles en el largo plazo. Thank you so much, Minister. And that is the really, you know, the perfect, um, the, the perfect transition back to the rest of our panel. Um, you know, really talking about partnership between companies, cities, and uh, and national leaders. And so, I'm going to just ask each of you to to close us out for sort of a quick, a very quick lightning round response. And Francesco, as uh, someone who has something very special to celebrate later today, I'm going to ask you to go first. Um, and just tell us, you know, what um, we we talk a lot about this enormous need for green infrastructure. And uh, these days, investors say that they have much money ready to, to invest in that. But how do you really need to go from this 
broad, high-level commitment to an actual bankable project? What are the most important things that need to happen for investments to really be ready to, to invest in? From your I perspective. Think, yeah, yeah. Well, I think the, the, the problem is always the same all over the world. It has to do with the fact that we do have a lot of ambition. And I think cities, mayors, governments, uh, as we've heard, have understood that there is a big solution that is decarbonize and then electrify. In order to do that, you need investments. And the money for that investment is there. So it is not a shortage of capital. The question is, what is in between? And what is in between is a set of governance tools that we inherit from our decades of past uh, industrial evolution, which is not any more fit for the ambition and the speed in with which we want to do this transformation. So, for example, what the minister has just said is super important. If a government understands this, this theme and starts to reform legally the system or even from a regulatory standpoint so that the uh, alignment of cities, the alignment of constituents and also the capabilities of investments to materialize is easier, mm -hmm. then that country benefits from this, uh, from this um, effort and sees the investment come and flow. If a country doesn't understand that, then the investments go elsewhere. So it's super important that governments understand that they have a key role in establishing regulatory frameworks and let's say rules that uh, discipline investment in, in, in that direction. And, and what Penny just said is a testimony of it. I mean, New York City needs energy. You cannot generate in the footprint of New York City, the energy New York City consumes, it's impossible. So you need to bring this energy from elsewhere. Big transmission line, distribution lines are the solution. You need to be able to permit these investments in a decent amount of time. So mm -hmm. it's all about reforming and aligning the regulatory and legal systems to this new opportunity. And then things will happen because the business is ready for that. Yeah. Well, Penny, I think Francesco has just thrown down a gauntlet to you as a city leader. So as a city leader, what is the most important thing to do to build and really increase that flow of bankable uh, projects? I mean, listen, we, we are not disagreeing with him. We are right now actively seeking and executing these projects based on um, partnerships with the private sector. I do think that um, the exciting role for cities, too, is that we represent the needs on the ground. Right. So these um, these projects that are being um, you know, brought to, you know, put together through with academics and experts and others in the field. Um, but we're also resonating with what are the needs in our communities. And so working with the cities and along with state and federal has been critical for um, for New York City. Great. OK, well, the minister, uh, you have the, uh, the last response at the national level. What is the most critical thing that a national policy leader must do to really accelerate investments in green infrastructure? Oops, I think you're on mute, minister. There you go. Sorry. Eh, gracias, Audrey. Creo que uniéndome un poco a las palabras de Francesco también, eh, aquí estamos hablando de varios temas y varias posibles fuentes de financiación para poder generar <coughs> impacto positivo en, en nuestros territorios. Uno primero sigue siendo el legislativo y un poco los que, lo que les contaba sobre la presentación de una nueva ley de acción climática. En la medida en que el Estado dice que en los próximos 10 años, al año 2030, tendremos un 30 o un 50% de movilidad eléctrica o de transporte público eléctrico, inmediatamente se van a generar desde el sector privado unas grandes oportunidades de inversión en los territorios. En la medida en que estamos hablando de economía circular, vamos a tener diferentes modelos de negocio alrededor de de esta política pública y de esta estrategia y se van a generar recursos desde el sector privado. Entonces aquí el sector privado juega un papel muy importante. También un, un proyecto no solamente del ejecutivo, sino del legislativo va a ayudar a que venga más rápidamente recursos de la cooperación internacional 
ya que es un compromiso de Estado y no simplemente de un gobierno. Entonces, desde el legislativo, con la presentación de proyectos de ley, vamos a poder estar generando posibilidades de inversión eh, hacia el futuro. Alia asociaciones y alianzas público-privadas, eh, que son muy importantes, y por supuesto, eh, algo que quisiera dejar en la mesa que para Colombia en este caso es muy importante y lo será también para las ciudades y los territorios, y es el mercado de carbono, que en el caso de Colombia estaremos en Glasgow en noviembre presentando ya todo el marco regulatorio de nuestro mercado voluntario de bonos de carbono. Entonces, fíjense que son diferentes fuentes con base en eh, estrategias sostenibles que nos van a permitir tener recursos propios tener fuentes de financiación desde el sector privado y el sector financiero, que juega un papel muy importante, todo el tema de ESG, por ejemplo. Eh, el sector financiero tiene que ir volcándose y los ministros de Hacienda de los países tienen que ir volcándose hacia unas estrategias fiscales eh, enfocadas en, en la sostenibilidad y en los recursos naturales. Entonces son diferentes fuentes que pueden llegar y es por eso que eh, los territorios tienen que tener mejor capacitación, más pedagogía para poder tener acceso a estos recursos. That's wonderful, Minister. Thank you so much. And I, I have to say, you know, so often um, uh, conversations about things like this especially in climate change, especially given the extraordinary events we've had this year are very depressing. And I really want to thank each of you for being so optimistic and so inspiring and showing really that there's a very clear roadmap of very simple um, investment opportunities that make sense, that are profitable, that create jobs, that are more sustainable, and that also can along the way, you know, address social justice issues and more equitable distribution of growth and its benefits and also protection from harm. So um, I think that, again, I really want to thank you for this incredible roadmap of what a corporate leader can do, what a city leader can do, and what, uh, what a national leader can do. And, you know, Minister, especially uh, your, your closing words about how we all need to go to Glasgow with really our highest ambitions, the most you know, aggressive possible commitments that we can each make and really try to, to use that as a way to, to push action forward. So I really, I thank you all so much for, uh, for your wonderful contributions here, but more importantly for everything that you do all day long in your, in your company, your city, and your country. And uh, we'll very much look forward to, uh, to seeing all of you virtually and potentially literally um, in, the, in the commitments that you will bring forward to Glasgow to really make a difference. So thank you so much to all of you and to, uh, to the forum. And that is gonna conclude our public portion of this, uh, of this session. And topic members, please stay on for the next session. But thank you all so much. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you. Thank you.